this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to talk about antibiotics. Specifically, we're going to focus on cephalosporins. Some key points to remember are one, always look at your culture data to wean down your antibiotics to exactly what bacteria is susceptible to. Two, for your cephalosporins, remember that from your first to third generation, your gram-positive activity actually gets worse but your gram-negative coverage actually improves. And your fourth-generation cephalosporins are pretty much good at both gram-positive as well as gram-negative coverage. So now let's focus on your first-generation cephalosporins. The examples of our first-generation cephalosporins are cephazolin, cephalexin, and cephadroxyl. In terms of the coverage that first-gen cephalosporins provide is one, they provide good gram-positive coverage. Specifically, they cover methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. In addition, they cover beta-hemolytic strep, proteus, E. coli, as well as klebsiella. So now let's talk about when you should use first-gen cephalosporins. First-generation cephalosporins should be used for the treatment of skin and soft tissue infections caused by streptococci as well as methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. You should not use first-gen cephalosporins to treat meningitis or other CNS infections. First-gen cephalosporins do not cover methicillin-resistant staph aureus, enterococci, Listeria monocytogenes, Legionella. In addition, they don't cover chlamydophila, mycoplasma, or Clostridium difficile. Keep in mind that first-gen cephalosporins have minimal gram-negative anaerobic activity. So if you need to cover gram-negative anaerobes, you likely need to add a second agent. First-gen cephalosporins are renally eliminated and require dose adjustments if a patient has acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. Keep in mind again that first-gen cephalosporins do not penetrate the blood-brain barrier, so they cannot be used for CNS infections like meningitis. Now let's focus on second-generation cephalosporins. These are cephotetin, cefuroxime, cefozitin, cefamandol, cefonisid, cefametazole. These agents have better gram-negative coverage than first-gen agents, but they do have less gram-positive activity. Cefuroxime has activity against Staph aureus, beta-lactamase-producing Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella. Cephamandol does have increased activity against E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Enterobacter, as well as non-beta-lactamase Haemophilus. Cefoxetin has increased activity against E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, and Serratia, as well as it's active against most strains of Bacteroides fragilis. In terms of the specifics of cephalosporins that are second-generation drugs, note that Second-gen drugs, such as cefuroxime, do penetrate the CNS with the presence of inflammation, so in active meningitis. But second-generation cephalosporins are inferior to third-generation, such as ceftriaxone or cefotaxime, in the treatment of meningitis. Second-gens are commonly used for community-acquired respiratory infections and urinary tract infections. Cefotetin and cefoxetine have improved gram-negative anaerobic activity and are used for community-acquired pneumonia, intra-abdominal infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, and urinary tract infection. In terms of the excretion of second-gen cephalosporins, they are renally eliminated and thus need to be adjusted if someone has acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. Cephamandol and cefotetin also interact with other medications, so they can cause an elevated INR by producing hypoprothrombinemia, meaning low prothrombin levels, leading to an elevated INR. So if a patient's on Coumadin, this may affect their weekly or monthly checking. So, and this also can cause bleeding problems as well. Note that these medications also can cause a disulfiram-like reaction, so patients who drink alcohol should be aware of that. Let's talk about your third-gen cephalosporins. These include cefotaxime, ceftriaxone, ceftazidine, cefpodoxime, and cefibutin, and ceftinir. So your third-gen cephalosporins are very widely used. And the reason is that their coverage includes 
improve gram-negative activity, though they do have poor gram-positive activity. Unfortunately, nowadays, Enterobacter has developed inducible resistance to third-gen cephalosporin, so they're not as good in those cases. Ceftazidime and cefepirazone have less activity against staph and strep than other third-gen agents. However, they do have activity against Pseudomonas. In addition, ceftazidime has greater activity against pseudomonas than cefepirazone. In addition, cefotaxime, ceftriaxone, and ceftazoxime have no activity against pseudomonas. They have better activity against methicillin-sensitive staph aureus and strep than ceftazidime or, or cefepirazone. Cefotaxine and ceftriaxone do have good CNS penetration in the presence of active inflammation or meningitis. So that's why we generally include them as part of our cocktail of antibiotics in treating meningitis. Oral agents, um, such as the ones listed, do not have activity against pseudomonas. But cefexime and cefibutin have the best gram-negative coverage of any oral cephalosporin. Um, but they do have poor activity against staph and strep again. These two medications do act, have activity also against Haemophilus, Moraxella, Neisseria, and other gram-negatives, so they do provide some extra coverage. Now let's talk about when these antibiotics are generally used. So for your third-gen cephalosporin, cefotaxime and ceftriaxone do have a primary role in the treatment of meningitis. Cefotaxime, ceftriaxone, and ceftazoxime are used also for community acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections, as well as pylo. Ceftriaxone can be used for the treatment of susceptible viridens group streptococcal endocarditis. And ceftazidine is also used for nosocomial gram-negative infections, like pseudomonas infections. And commonly is used in combination with an aminoglycoside as well. So let's talk about the interactions with third-gen cephalosporins, as well as how they are excreted. No, cefepirazone can lead to hyperprothrombinemia. Like we talked about before, when that happens, you can cause an elevated INR. In addition, cefoparazone is also eliminated in bile. So in patients with biliary obstruction, this may not be the medication you want to go to. Most third-generation cephalosporins are renally eliminated except for ceftriaxone, which has dual elimination with the kidneys and liver. Note, ceftriaxone can also cause pseudocholelithiasis, meaning the feeling like you have a gallbladder stone. This usually stops after the medication is stopped. In addition, because ceftriaxone is eliminated partly through the bile, it can precipitate in the gallbladder and act as a nidus for stone formation, meaning it can create stones in the gallbladder. So specifically, you should look out for this, but also note, never give this medication with IV calcium. So let's talk about fourth gen cephalosporins, specifically cefepime. Cefepime has good gram-negative coverage and good gram-positive coverage. It covers methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, strep, gram-negatives, pseudomonas, enterobacter. But note, you really do not use any ceph, including cefepime, against any ESBL gram-negative bacilli. ESBL means an extended-spectrum beta-lactamase producer. Now, fourth-gen cephalosporins penetrate the CNS. They have broad spectrum of activity. And commonly, they're used for the treatment of febrile neutropenia. These are renally excreted, and they have generally the same reactions to other cephalosporins, like diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, as well as vomiting. Note, all cephalosporins are bactericidal, and they work like any other beta-lactamase drug, in that they disrupt the peptidoglycan layer of the bacterial cell wall. Note that if someone has a penicillin allergy, there's a 5% chance they will also develop a reaction to a cephalosporin. Alright, that's a brief review of cephalosporins. If you like this video, give it a like. If you have any comments or, su or suggestions for future videos, place them down below and subscribe. So this is Dr. K from iMedical School. I'll see you next time.